Right, so, good morning everybody. Um, so just a word about when this lecture will start. I realise you're coming from maths, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to kick off at exactly three minutes past. That's like three minutes later than I meant to. So that should give you a good 13 minutes to get here from maths. Um, right, so then, here we are. How your first week been? Good? Yeah. Okay, well, I think Friday is going to be better because you've got this lecture now and labs with this lecture. <laughs> so, this is called Computer Programming with MATLAB. And I'm Dr. Roderick McKenzie, or Rod, as you can call me, I don't mind. And I'm going to teach this to you. I'm going to, so, by the end of this course, you're basically going to know how to program a computer. And here's an outline of today's lecture. So, firstly, I'm going to try and convince you mechanical engineers that you need to learn to program a computer. And this isn't just the domain of the computer scientists. Then, it's a bit awkward looking up there, I'm sorry. Um, then I'm going to give you some examples of computing and engineering and try and show you that basically nothing in the modern world functions without a computer. Then I've got to do some boring stuff. I've got to tell you about the modules, so like exams and coursework and things like that that are no fun. But we've got to do that anyway. Then I'm going to do a really quick introduction to programming in a language called MATLAB. Um, yeah, and we won't have that much time to learn that much today because there's other stuff we've got to cover. Um, but it's enough to get you started the lab that will happen later. So, let's go. Right, if you think of any mechanical system in the modern world, so if you think of jet engines, ABS brake systems, airbags, aircraft control systems, 3D printers, they are all run with computers. In fact, they won't function without a computer. And the, I was trying to think of a purely mechanical device that you just use mechanical engineering to make. And the only device I could think of was an alarm clock, a mechanical alarm clock, right? Everything else today has a computer. So if we look at, for example, this jet engine, there's a man doing something with that jet engine there. That's a mechanical system. But on the side of it, you can see this big box of electronics, which is a computer. And that thing um, will control, basically, fuel injection, you know, control how the it's basically engine management. So there's a computer there. And if we go down to like the smaller scale, so the sort of the MakerBot um, 3D printer scale, so there's a MakerBot like print, printing a head or something. If you look carefully, so this is a mechanical thing that's doing some 3D printing. If you look carefully on the top, there's this board. And into that board, you can see a little Ethernet cable going. And this board is controlling the motors, basically. And that is a computer. So whatever device you look at, there's a computer in it. So you guys need to learn how to program computers. It just comes with a job these days. Now you might say, um, well, I've got computer scientist friends. They can just do the programming for that and the programming for that, and I don't need to worry about it. Why are you telling me about this computing stuff? Well, the problem with computer scientists is they aren't very clever. No, <laughs> that's not true. You can't tell them that. The problem with computer scientists is they don't understand how these mechanical devices work, right? So you guys at the end of this course will know how this jet engine works. You'll know how it performs at different pressures, you know, different altitudes, different temperatures, and you'll really under understand what makes this engine tick? But a computer scientist won't. He'll be able to write beautiful computer code, but he won't understand the actual machine he's trying to write the computer code for, which is a very dangerous scenario. Whereas you guys might not be able to write such a beautiful computer code, but at least you understand the machine. So the guys who always write the code to go in computers in mechanical systems are you guys. So you've got to know how to program them. This is a big part of, or will be a big part of any job you take up. So, what's this course all about? What, what am I going to teach you? Well, I'm going to teach you how to write programs in a computer language called MATLAB. Okay? And I have to say now that this language is pretty similar to all other languages, computer languages. It's pretty generic. So once you, learn, once you do the hard work in this module and you learn MATLAB, you can basically program any language. Okay? So it's like giving you a huge toolbox of languages you can program. Now, <coughs> what I'm going to try and do, because I've only got like... 11 hours to tell you this stuff, I would try and tell you the most important things that I can think about in programming. So I'm going to try and give you basically a, to a computing toolbox, so there's a toolbox, of super, super useful um, sort of tools that you can solve your engineering problems with. So you can think of this lecture like I'm giving you a toolbox to solve your problems with. And I always like to think of computing, so if you're an engineer, I always like to think of computing as uh, for the engineer, it's basically a way to get to the pub quicker, okay? Because the computer will solve your problems really quickly, much quicker than you could possibly do by hand. So, for example, at the moment, if I gave you a, a polynomial, if I said, you know, 1 plus, uh, I don't know, x plus x squared, you could solve that by hand. 
right? It would take you, what, five minutes or so. But if I gave you one with a million terms, there's no way you'd be able to solve that. And very often, very, very quickly, you, have, you reach situations in engineering because you're, you're, you're trying to interact with the real world. The systems become very complex, and the maths describing it becomes very complex. So very quickly, you can no longer do your maths on pen and paper. You must do it on computer. So, and a computer could solve a polynomial with maybe a million terms in five seconds, and you can't. So computers like give you sort of the Superman ability to do maths and to, to solve the problems that are impossible to solve otherwise. <coughs> There's some notes here. Not that I'm drawing attention to you by being late. <laughs> there you go. That's all right. So examples of computing in engineering. So uh, for this, I'm going to need an audio cable. One moment. Now then, um, now, there's, if you think about rocket travel, so this is an example about why you need computers. If you think about rocket travel, rocket travel is very expensive. If you want to get to space, you, the notes are here. There you go. Um, so, if you think about rocket travel, it's very expensive. So if you want to get to space, what you've got to do is buy one of those. And those cost about 200 million quid. They're very expensive. So if you want to launch a satellite, you put your satellite on top of a rocket like that. The rocket launches, goes into space, releases the satellite, the satellite orbits the Earth, and the rocket crashes into the ocean and burns. So to get this satellite up there, it's cost you 200 million quid. That's very expensive. This is like a one-use vehicle. That's why it's expensive. Now think about cycling. Imagine this morning to get to university, if you'd bought a bicycle in the bicycle shop, you cycled to university and you chucked it in the bin. And then when you wanted to get home, you bought a new bicycle and you cycled home and then chucked it in the bin. And this process repeated day after day after day. So you've got like a one-use bicycle. I mean, it's stupid. Bicycles would then be so expensive, you could, nobody could afford to cycle them, right? So this is the same problem with rockets. And there's a company um, in the US that's trying to solve this problem by making reusable rockets. So I'm going to show you a video of this reusable rocket, and I'm going to show you why you need a computer to run this. Uh. It's got to be big. Right. Anybody else want to leave, like those guys? No? OK. Right. So what we're looking at here... What we're looking at here is a huge rocket. So this isn't something you might have in your garden. So this is a water tower, right? And this is basically a lorry, okay? So this thing is probably about the size of six or seven lorries. And if you look really carefully, there's actually, there's actually a mannequin there or a cowboy. Like, that's the size of a person, just to give it some scale. Now, let's blast this rocket off. Now, I just want to show you something here. If you look at this engine, what it's got on it, so this, this is a rocket engine here, it's got some actuators. So this is basically a hydraulic actuator that's moving that engine to basically control which way that the rocket goes. So in a minute, you'll see this actuator move. And if you watch the flame of the rocket, it'll actually shift to the right and to the left too. So this is a hovering rocket, okay? So this is like the first step to reusing rockets, making it hover and then land again. Now, what I want you to think about is this. I'm not going to do this now because I'm in front of 300 people, but have you ever tried to balance a pencil on your finger like that? Yeah, it always ends in disaster. I'm not going to do it. But what you've got to do to keep this pencil vertical is keep, keep moving your finger underneath it to like change the force you're applying to it to keep it pointing vertically. And what, this, what, this rock, what the computer in the rocket is doing at this, at this very moment is changing the direction of the thrust of the rocket to keep it vertical. And if it didn't keep on correcting its course, the rocket would just fall over like that and crash. Right, 
that's enough of that. So what you've got there is an example of a computer basically making a super unstable system, which is a massive rocket balancing on, on one rocket engine possible. If you didn't have the computer there continually correcting the, 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 basically how the rocket, which direction the rocket engine is firing, that would be a big explosion. The rocket would just fall over. So this could not be done without a computer. Right. Next example. Right. Now, um, crash testing. So that's an example of a computer controlling the world. Very often, engineers want to use computers to predict the world. And the way people used to crash, uh, crash test cars was by getting a car and driving it into a brick wall, just like that. And they used to see what happened to the dummies inside it. And if the dummies got injured, then they thought we had to redesign the car. This is OK if you've got a Skoda or one of those nasty VWs, because they're cheap now. But if you've got like an expensive car, like a Jaguar or a Bentley or something like that, doing iterative design with crash tests is a very expensive thing to do, because you've got to write off like a £100,000 car each time you want to slightly move the steering wheel to improve the design or something. So <coughs> what engineers have done is they've written computer code to basically put this simulation, this basically car, in a computer simulation, and they can crash it vir virtually again and again and again within seconds at basically no cost, and they can sort of move the steering wheel, move the pedal, and look what happens when, when you have a very bad front on impact. And this saves literally millions of pounds to the car industry. So this is an example of basically predictive, computers being used to predict stuff and improve designs. So let's have a look at a video. Where is it? There we go. Ah. Right, so make it big. So on the left, we've got the, the real car. On the right, we've got the simulation. So I'll just let it run through so you can have a look at it. Boom. Run again. Boom. Now we'll step through it. So just watch what happens. Compare them. So at this stage, you can see both the bonnet in the simulation has, has crumpled, and so is this bonnet. Push it forward again. Can you see the drive shaft? So this is the drive shaft under here has buckled out and been pressed down in both the simulation and, in, and in, in reality. And if we step it forward again, we can probably see more similarities. So what's happened? I mean, you can see the car's like risen up here. It's risen up here on the suspension. So this really is a very, very accurate simulation. So this type of thing, I could very easily see you doing um, as an engineer on, on the first few days of your, your, new, your, your new job when you leave university. So predicting things with computers. So, presentation. Right, the other, the other area where computers are going to help you out a load is when measuring the real world. So I guess at school, you um, would have done the experiment where you heat up, a, heat up a beaker of water with a Bunsen burner, you stick a thermometer in it, and you try and calculate the specific heat capacity by measuring every five minutes um, the temperature of the beaker as it cools down. Now that's fine in school, uh, sounds like freshers flu. <laughs> yeah, I get that in about a week. It's, br it's brilliant. Every year. Um, so, at school, you measure the temperature of, say, a beaker of water every five minutes to, to look at how it, how it warms and cools. Now, this is fine in school, but once you get to, to do real engineering, you'll have much more data than you can handle. Imagine trying to measure the temperature along the profile of, of this jet engine. Um, it's, it's a very, it's very, it'll be a very complicated uh, temperature profile. And what you'll do is you might have maybe 100 thermometers, so 100 maybe like uh, electrical thermometers in this engine, maybe every few centimeters to look at the, the temperature profile. And this will generate a great deal of data. And rather than measuring the temperature of these thermometers every five minutes like you did at school, you want much better resolution. You want to do it much, much more quickly because these engines react very, very quickly because it's gas, so it heats up very quickly. So you maybe need to measure rather than the temperature rather than every five minutes, every five milliseconds or every five microseconds. And very quickly, you're going to be generating gigabytes of data extremely quickly that you, know, you just have not got a hope of writing down, even if, you, if, it, if it was you and 100 friends. So what we do is we join, basically, measurement systems like ones that measure this jet engine up to computers, and they log all the data. And you'll be doing this, too, in the industry or in your third and fourth year projects. It's a very common use of computers. So, ah, and the final point I want to make is, um, so also, in this example, and this example, what I didn't say is, you might think, well, why don't I go and buy a package? Why don't I just go and pay somebody £40,000 and I'll just download the package to do these simulations? 
The problem is, you guys are probably going to be working like at the cutting edge of engineering, and nobody's written the package to do this. It's not like Microsoft Word, we can just download it. You know, it doesn't exist. Nobody's written a package to measure your jet engine. So you've got to go and write the code to measure, to collect the data. There's nobody else that can do it. And same with here. You might think, well, you know, there's crash test programs available. There might be, but they won't uh, be, they probably won't do exactly what you want them to do. So you'll have to edit this code. Right, about this module. So, uh, you might have noticed that at the back of the room there's a video camera. Now that's focused basically on me and the stage. It doesn't look at any of you. Um, now, my plan is to record all the lectures and then somehow, I don't know yet, put them on some website or something, I don't know what yet, so you can look at them during revision. So you can like play the lecture back and you know, see what I say again. I thought this might be very helpful for you. Um, I've never done this before. It might not work. It might work. I might, it might be lots of work for me. I might then give up. I don't know. But I'm going to try. So um, just be aware I'm recording at the back. Um, oh, and it can't hear you either because it's taking it off this microphone and uh, it's rubbish. So whatever you say, questions, whatever, can't, you, won't, you won't be on the video. Yeah. Right. So computer programming is a practical skill. I can't teach you really to program computers. So there's going to be like lots of labs where you can learn and practice what I, what I teach you in this lecture. And what we're going to do after this lecture is we're all going to go to labs and we're going to go to C19 in Coates. It's like the top, top floor above the cafe. C20 in Coates. That's like also above the cafe in, in Coates. And the Engineering Science Learning Centre, whatever they call it. Um, and that's the top floor of that building. So if you go into the cafe, there's a little ramp going down into the big building like with the, where, where, the, where the secretaries sit. Go right to the top floor. There's another computer room. And there's going to be me there to help you with, with the problems. So I'm going to be there all the time. And there's going to be nine other PhD student demonstrators. And they're experts at MATLAB. So if you've got any questions about anything, ask them. They are there. I pay them like, for every hour that they're there. They're there to help you. So anything, ask them questions. So hopefully it'll be very interactive. Now, if you, if you turn, so I'm just going to go through this now. If you, if you pick up this, there's some introduction. So keep going. There's a, cheat, there's a MATLAB cheat sheet that's quite handy. So that's got like some key commands in it that you, 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 might, know, you might want to know. And then, no, go past the coursework. There's something called worksheet one. Okay? It says worksheet one, and there's some basic some maths there. I, so the idea is that in this next two hours after this lecture, you go through these worksheets. Um, what do I say on the screen? Now, the worksheets are basically staggered. So the beginning of the worksheets, it's incredibly easy. At the end, it's quite difficult. And what, I, what my plan is, is you probably do about 50 to 60% of the worksheet in, in the two hours later, and then there's some spare for revision. So some people will be really quick, finish it easily. Some people will be very slow, need more time. Don't worry, I've made the example sheets like to stretch the most difficult person and also offer something to the, to, the, to the person who doesn't like it that much. So these worksheets will be done in the example class that comes next. Right, now then. Uh, sorry, I've, I've just got to do this housekeeping and it'll make the module run really easily. Being on time to the lab, I really don't care if you're late to the lab. You can, you can go and get sandwiches, you can go and get coffee, you can go away for five minutes, don't care. You know, come, go as you like. It's your time, we're there to help you. Having said that, being on time to lecture, please, please, please be on time to lecture. I, I really beg of you to be on time to lecture. Because if there's 30 students like at school in your class and 10% are late, that gives like three interruptions. You get about an interruption every 30 minutes. If 10% of 300 students are late, you get an interruption every 120 seconds, right? Um, which just makes the class a bit, you know, disruptive. And you notice I reserved these seats here um, today. So I noticed everybody came in this door. What I'm going to do next lecture is reserve these seats here for latecomers, okay? So if you're late, sit here, because then you're not disturbing the rest of the class. Uh, and if you're late in 20 minutes, really consider whether it's worth coming to the lecture, because you, you, you will cause disturbance. Just, I'm not saying you can't come in, I'm just saying think about it. Right, coursework. So I'm sorry, I've got to do this. Um, the module, how do you pass the module? 
there's a coursework one, which I've just handed out. So if you go back, uh, where are we? It's just after cheat sheet. So this is coursework one, and I've just handed this out. I've also, right, handed out the marking scheme. So you know exactly how you get your marks. So if you turn over like another two pages, you get the marking scheme. So you can literally tick off what questions you've done and what percentage of the mark you think you've got already. And this is preliminary, by the way. It may change slightly. But the result of this is that everybody gets about 80% in this first coursework, 70 or 80%. Everybody does really well in this first coursework. And it's not that tricky. It might need a bit of work, but it's not that tricky. Next coursework will come in like four weeks' time. So this first coursework takes about four weeks. Um, and then at the end, you get an exam that's worth 60%, and it's 1.5 hours. Um, so you can actually pass this module just by doing coursework. So if you get 100% on both coursework, you don't actually have to come to the exam, although I recommend it. Okay? Um, uh, everybody passes this module. That's the other thing I want to say. Basically, it's, it's not a module people fail. I, I've tried to make it sort of like a nice learning experience for MATLAB. I'm trying to get you to learn MATLAB rather than get, set you difficult tests. So this is trying to enjoy this Friday morning. It's a, you know, it's a time when you can learn something new. Uh, anything else I want to say? Oh, yeah. Officially, in the examples class, you are to do the worksheet, only the worksheet, and we are to give you no help with the coursework because it's your coursework to do in your, in your free time. However, I don't care. Um, <laughs> now, you can ask demonstrators how to do the coursework. You can ask me how to do the coursework. You can ask us to look at your code. We'll help you with it. We'll debug it for you. We will help you with the coursework, okay? Because, again, I want you to have fun doing this module, and I want you to learn MATLAB. Not, it's not some type of random test. Um, however, having said that, if you don't do the worksheets at all and, st and try to start the coursework, you'll find the coursework very difficult because the, the worksheets like, lead you up to it and they teach you some basic things. So my suggestion is, this is my, only my suggestion, first week do the, uh, do the worksheet because it gets you into MATLAB, don't start the coursework. Then week two, my suggestion is try and split your time. One hour worksheet, one hour coursework. Okay? And just, just do it how you feel. You know, if you want to do more worksheet, do more worksheet. If you want to do more coursework, do more coursework. But if you don't do the worksheets, coursework would be difficult. Any questions on that? Any questions? No? Good. Um, now, some people say books. What, what books do I need? Uh, oh, by the way, the coursework handing date is wrong on the lecture notes. It's correct on all the computer systems and here somewhere. Is it here? No. There. That's it. You might want to write this down. Tuesday, the 3rd of November, 2015. I'll write that down. I'll probably email you it too. And it, it's on, I think it's on some computer system that you can look at too. Have you written that down? Yeah? Are we happy? I'll give you 10 more seconds. Tuesday, the 3rd of November. Right. Um, and I'll, I'll email you with that date again, too. Pe some people say, what books do I need for this module? What, what book can I buy? Well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you this. I don't have any MATLAB books, because I've got Google. And Google's much better than any books. So it's also cheaper. Um, but if you want to buy a book, it might help you, you know, depending on how you learn. These books are okay. I've not really read them properly. Other people have recommended them to me. Um, they're pro there's loads of MATLAB books in the library. Just go and look at the library, thumb through some books, see which ones you like. You know, um, it might help you, might not help you. I prefer Google. You know, that's just me. Good. Now, where else can I get help for, for MATLAB? Well, the library... Um, there's some books in there, might like them, might not like them. This is really underused. This help button on MATLAB. So when you click that, you get MATLAB, MATLAB help, and it's quite good. But the best one is Google, especially uh, Stack Exchange. That's quite good. Um, that's a site that's uh, got lots of questions about programming and stuff. So try. Now, when you get stuck, you, in the examples class, you can put your hand up and you can ask a question. And you can be like, tell me the answer. And we'll tell the answer. But you might want to try finding it yourself first on Google. You might, because when you get to your third and fourth year projects, um, you won't have us there. You know, we won't be able to help you because the class is over. 
<laughs> so it might be worth just, I suggest, maybe give it to Google to start with because it then gets you in the habit of solving problems yourself and sort of being self-sufficient. But obviously, we're very happy to help you. If you just stick your hand up, we're very happy to help you. Right, if you've got questions, ask them in the lecture or um, during the examples class, because I understand there's 10 people there who are actually paid to help you. Now, if you are falling behind with MATLAB, if you get worried, if you lose sleep over it, sometimes there's one person, like every two years or so, there's like one person who says, oh, I can't do this. If you start losing sleep over MATLAB, get worried, email me, okay? Just send me an email and say, I'm really worried about this, I'm just not keeping up. I will help you. I will, I, will, I will find a demonstrator or somebody to give you some time or something, okay? Don't lose sleep over MATLAB. Email me, okay? Um, yeah, also Twitter, but I don't know. Try that if you want. Coursework, one. I've just been over that. Plagiarism. I don't think anybody's talked about plagiarism yet, have they? No? Uh, how are we doing for time, by the way? Oh, we've got ages. Right. Plagiarism is basically copying your mate's work. Don't do it. <laughs> it's that simple, right? It seems obvious, but um, the biggest danger for you guys um, in the like, digital age is if you send your mate your work, he might send it to his mate, and then his mate might send it to another person, and then he'll send it to another person. And this happened, in, not in this course, but in a master's module I was teaching. And 17 people handed in identical work just with the name changed. And it, like, I was like, oh, it's just took, took, like, please don't do it, it's just silly. So don't send your, your work to your friends, like, at all, yeah? <laughs> I just want to show you some examples here. So this is like an example from a master's course I teach for plagiarism. So a student on the left, a student on the right, that, so the computer gives us to us when you hand it in. So added lines, changed lines, deleted lines. So we've literally just changed the English comments, and it's just really obvious to see. So please don't do this. Um, I'm hoping by showing this, nobody does it. Another example, so student one on the left, student two on the right, um, literally, like, taking this chunk of code here out, popped it at the bottom here, hand it in. So please don't do this. Another one people do is just change the variable names a bit or something like that. Please don't. Just, ah, right. Yeah. Um, now, I don't expect you to work in isolation. So I've got to say, this is individual work, coursework, not group work. However, you can talk to your friends about it. You can look at your friend's code. You can discuss the problem with your friends. You can even, at a push, you can work together on a piece of code, and then you can go, both go off and write different code and then hand the different code in. You know, but you mustn't hand work in that somebody else has done. That's the point. So you can, you can discuss things, you encourage you know, working together, but hand in your own work, not work somebody else did. Thank goodness. That's out of the way. So now on to introduction to programming. Right, so that's all like the introduction. Right, is programming difficult? This is what all people say. Is it difficult? Well, you've got a huge advantage over um, other, basically people in other countries because you all speak English as your first or second language and all the commands in programming are English commands. So, what do you think the beep command does? What was that? It beeps, exactly. What, so there's no tricky answer here. What do you think the plot command does, somebody? Plot a graph. What do you think the save command might do? Save something, yeah? So you've learned three commands already. This is super easy. There's no real memorizing to do. Now, however, I'm going to give you a warning. Um, how many of you programmed before? Hands up. A smattering. Right. Now, all of you have done maths and physics and chemistry from when you're about this big, okay? And you, like, know how the subject goes. You know the flow of it. You know what to do in maths. You know how to learn maths. You've got to appreciate that computer programming is a new thing that's new to you, and you've never done it before. And what this means is, it may, it may be a little bit frustrating in the beginning. You may, like, it might, might infuriate you. Um, but it's not difficult. You've just got to appreciate you're learning a new skill, and you'll get over this quite quickly. So just have patience with yourself. Like you, yeah, just have patience with yourself and just appreciate. Tell yourself, it's a new skill I'm learning. It's well worth the effort. You know, uh, it's just how it goes. Now... <coughs> I always think that programming is like playing an instrument. So there's uh, Eric Clapton there with his guitar. Now, a music teacher could tell you how to, how to play Layla in about five minutes. So you could say, just put this finger there, st strum it like that, you know. He could actually tell you how to do it in about five minutes. But that wouldn't make you a rock star. The way you'd become a rock star 
is by practicing and practicing and practicing like every day. Practice, 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 practice. And it's the same with programming. Don't memorize stuff. Don't, don't just look at it and go, yeah, I've learned that. You haven't. Practice. Do the worksheets and get better. Like, do some different code. Do some change of code. Use MATLAB for a different lab where you might not need MATLAB for. And just try and speed your life up with MATLAB. It's all about practicing. So, now then, thinking like a programmer. So we've got uh, Bart Simpson. Bart Simpson. Remembering commands is easy, so you've basically learned them already because you can speak English. The tricky part that always people have difficulty with is breaking down um, a problem into manageable chunks that you can implement in a computer. So it's like transferring that real-world problem into steps the computer can understand. This is where every, everybody who's not done programming before um, slips up. So before we start programming, we're going to have a go at trying to break a problem down into like little little steps. So let's have a go, just with flow diagrams. So this is our first, our first program. This is a program to decide whether or not to launch a rocket. So boxes are basically things um, that get done. Trying these sort of boxes on their sides are um, decisions, and the arrows represent program flow. So this, this program will, start a rocket, will decide whether or not to start to fire a rocket. So it says start, check the time. Is it time to launch the rocket? No. Go back round. Check the time. Is it time to launch the rocket? No. Go back round. Check the time. Is it time to launch the rocket? Yes. Start the main engines of the rocket. So this is a simple program. And what we've done is we've broken a real-world task down into like manageable chunks that we can feed to a computer. And you're going to have to do this in your head whenever you tackle a problem. So we've got actions in boxes, questions, or questions in these triangle things, and program flow with arrows. Now it's your go. What I'd like you to do is, on the back of the notes, or somewhere, I'd like you to make a new program, and it's quite long, this one, and it must include, so it's a program to make a cup of tea, and it must include only these steps. Add milk, is the tea cor the correct strength, switch on the power of the kettle, has the water boiled, pour the water into the cup, fill the kettle with water, finish and stop. And there's prizes for, like, the first ten people. Small prizes the first 10 people who do it. Go. <coughs> Edible prizes. <laughs> put, put, put it in boxes. <coughs> How are we doing? Good, good start, good start. Yeah, two, yeah, good start. Three boxes. Oh, doing well there. Huh? Can you hear me at the back? I'll be back in five, in five seconds. Hi, like another three minutes, and I'll, I'll come and get you. Oh, what's that? Almost. You're like three boxes away from the, what are they? A chocolate brownie. <laughs> oh, that almost finished. Is that finished? No, not yet. Close. I haven't got given away any yet. Looking good. Pop your hand up when you're finished. Oh, got to go over there. <sighs> Nobody finished over here. No, close. Let's look at this. Where are you? Who's finished? Oh, that looks good. I've only got one box of these, so it's limited. There we go, very good. You done it? Yeah, I haven't written it down. But I've got oh, well, in which case. Anybody else done it? Let's see it, show it up. Hold it up, hold it up. There we go. Have you done it? Can you give her one? 
quick, quick, quick. Have we all done it? There we go. Yep, good. How, uh, whoop. How are we doing here? Oh, this is your one. Done it. Good, good. All good, looking good. There we go. We're doing, yeah, very good. There's not many left, I have to say. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That'll do. Yep, yeah, that'll do. Right. I'll trust, I've got limited time, so I'm just going to have to trust you to share these out fairly. So you might want to give one for Lady at the end, who's also got it. Right. So I'm sorry, I've got, I've got really limited time. Um, I've only got 10 minutes. Right. So, I'm afraid I tricked you. The program crashes. Do you know why? There's no tea bag. Ah, right. So what's going to happen is it's going to run down here, up to here, and go, is the T the correct strength? No, 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 no. The T is never going to be the correct strength because there's no tea bag. Right? So that your first program you've written crashes. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> right. Have you heard the joke? Have you heard the joke about the computer programmer? Listen, you've got to pay attention to this. This is actually, actually quite serious. Whoop! Guys, I can't talk over you. Thank you. So, have you heard the joke about the computer programmer? A woman asked her husband, a computer programmer, to go, to go to the store and buy one pint of milk, and if they have eggs, get six. Okay? The man comes back from the store with six pints of milk. And the wife asks him, why did you get six pints of milk? The man replied, they've got eggs. Right? There's a comma missing, yeah? So the program is applied logic, like exactly, just like you did in the program you've just written, right? Computers do this, they don't think. If you tell them to do something, they will do it. They will not question you, right? So when you're programming, remember this joke. When you're programming, remember this joke when you make a mistake because they, you know, you're going to do it. You're going to tell them something stupid and it will do it. Right, very basic to MATLAB, so I've got 10 minutes to, to, to get through this. Um, basically, MATLAB is an incredibly powerful... Um, I'm just going to talk to somebody outside, tell them to go away. Guys, guys, I'm sorry, I, just, I, I haven't got time to, to introduce you today. If you just go to the computer rooms um, directly, I'm sorry. I'm, hi, I'm sorry, yeah, I can't, I'm sorry. Sorry, I was going to introduce the demonstrators, but we've got no time. So MATLAB is an incredibly powerful um, programming language. Now, you can basically program with it uh, jet fighters, graphical user interfaces. You can uh, rig emission systems on dodgy cars. You can uh, program factories. Like, MATLAB is so powerful, it can do any of your engineering challenges. But before, uh, before we do this, before we, before we can run, basically, I need to show you how to walk. So this next five minutes, I'm going to teach you how to basically walk with, with programming. So starting MATLAB. When you go to the lab in, five, in ten minutes, you're going to click on the Windows button and type in MATLAB. You can then choose whatever version of MATLAB you want. Now, the one I recommend is MATLAB 2014A 64-bit. They might have upgraded it to, like, 2015. But anyway, all those will do. When you open it, you get this window. And this is where you type... And this is where you get the, basically, the command history. So this is where you type stuff in. Now, basics, basic mathematics in MATLAB. So MATLAB, the commands are just a bit like Excel, really. It's, it's super simple. So if you want to multiply, like 8 times 3, you go 8 times 3, enter. If you want to go 7 divided by 10, use a backslash. If you go 7 to the power of 3, it's a hat. If you, go, if you want to add, it's a plus, and brackets work just like they do in math. So you've learned like five operations in MATLAB already. I'm just going to show you how, how you do this in MATLAB. Right, so here we go. I've made this text super big so you can see at the back. It's much smaller than reality. So 8 times 3, enter. 7 divided by 10... Enter. See, it's ever so easy. Uh, so if you can type 7 to the power of 3, 300 and something. 3 plus 7 divided by 4, etc., etc., and brackets work as well. Yeah? 
So it's super simple. So you can basically use it as a calculator now. It's going to get more complicated, but we've made a start. Right, so we've done that. Brackets work. Now, this is the point I want to make about, about computers being stupid and not understanding. If in maths you wrote 2 times brackets 1 plus 3, you'd get, what would you get? You'd get 8, yeah? And if you wrote 2 brackets 1 plus 3, you'd also get 8. But computers are stupid. Can anybody guess why this wouldn't work? You haven't told to multiply. So here what happens is the computer goes 2 star, oh that's a multiply, I'm going to be multiplying. Good, open brackets and it does its stuff. Here it goes, 2 bracket, ah, you haven't told me what to do, what do I do now? So this wouldn't work, it applies no intelligence at all. This is how computer, computers really are. And they sometimes look clever, but that's only because they've had a clever programmer. So watch out for traps like that. So think back to the, pro the programmer with his 6 pints of milk. Um, Variables. So in maths, if I said y equals a plus b plus c, um, and calculate y for a equals 1, b equals 2, c equals 3, for like, whoops, sorry, for like 10 marks, you'd be able to do it. What's the answer to that? 6, right? Super easy. It works exactly the same in MATLAB. So if you want to, if you want to calculate, if you want the computer to do this calculation for you, you just go a equals 1, b equals 2, c equals 3, and you just type y equals a plus b plus c. So it's exactly like you do in maths. Okay? Super easy. And I just want to introduce this concept. So I always like to think of a variable. So these are called variables. So a, b, c, y, a, b, c are called variables in computing. And I always like to think of a variable as like a box, like this, okay? And I like to think of this box as being called box A, for example. And in this box, A, you put a number, and it stores the number 1. And you've got another box called box B. I'm going to drop this. And we call this box B. And box B stores a number, which is B, which is 2. So whenever you think of a variable, a nice way to think of them is there's like virtual boxes in your head that like store numbers for you. And we'll expand this concept later. Any questions so far? <coughs> Please, please do shout out, because if, if you've got questions, you're, other people are probably thinking it too, and I'm really happy to answer. So really, I really like to make this interactive. So some traps. I'm now going to teach you about some traps people always do in MATLAB. So we don't, we're not restricted to A, B, C, and Y like we are in maths. We have other variable names. So we can have Alfred, Bob, Chris, and Jan. And then we can add Alfred to Bob to Chris and calculate what Jan is. So we can call variables anything. We can call them, you know, your name or, you know, anything. What you can't call them is you can't put spaces in them. So cr space is is not allowed. It's got to be Chris. What's also not allowed is variables that start with a 1. So 1 Chris is not allowed. Um, now, imagine I said evaluate this. So evaluate y equals a the 4a to the 4. 4 plus 2b to 3. I think we've got to speed up. How much more do I have to do? Yeah, uh, to the 3. In MATLAB, you'd simply type in a equals 1, b equals 2, c equals 3, and then you just apply those operations I taught you uh, previously, and you'd be able to evaluate this. Now, how are we doing for time? Three minutes. Now, the other trick people fall into is in MATLAB, if you want a to equal 1, you must type a equals 1. You can't type 1 equals A like in maths. The variable must always be on the left-hand side. Um, you know lots of mathematical functions already, so you know sine, you know cos, you know tan, right? They're all the same in MATLAB. Like, you know, you, all these mathematical terms you know work in MATLAB. So sine, sine, pi is pi, by the way. Can you guess what squrt is? S-Q-R-T? Square it, yeah? It's easy. Like, you can just remember these commands without even thinking. So, uh, the other trap people fall into is when you use these mathematical functions, you've got to use round brackets, like that, round brackets. Any other brackets, 
don't use them. So curly brackets, square brackets, triangle brackets, don't use them. It will not work. It's incredibly um, particular about what, what brackets it has. I'm not going to do this because we've not got time. This is basically just a, another class example that you can do in your own time. I've actually printed the answer on the notes. Scientific notation. This is the last thing I'm going to teach you before you go to lab. Can, you, can I just have your attention for like... I, yeah, thanks. One minute. If you, if you wanted to t type the number a million, so one zero 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 zero, um, you could type one zero 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 zero. That takes a long time. It takes like seven key presses. A much quicker way to write this is one e to the to, to the six. An e means times ten to the. Now, do not confuse this E with ex exponent in maths. It's totally different. E on a computer, like that, means to the 10. Okay? So, for example, 3E8 means 3 times uh, 10 to the 8. Or 4, 1, 2, 3, E4 means 4, 1, 2, 3 times 10 to the 4. Right. Summary. I've told you why you need to use, or try to convince you why you need to use computers in engineering and why you guys must learn about computers to be good at them, um, to be a good engineer. Um, I've told you about the course. Don't just pack up yet. Uh, and that's really it. We, we've done an intro to MATLAB. Next lecture will be much more MATLAB focused rather than like introduction. The final thing is, can I please see all students who have done the foundation year now here. So the rest of you, please go to the labs and the demonstrators are waiting there for you. So C19 coats, C20 coats, top floor of the ESLC.